the prism and the maximum condition resolve. So what happens when you don't listen well to the patient? Don't listen to the patient. Almost 60% of cases, patients misunderstood the direction after a visit to the doctor's office. They don't know how to take the medication. They don't know uh, where they need to go uh, to seek another uh, medical treatment. They leave, they don't know what they have in their hand. I know that a lot of patients came to me and told me the physician gave us those papers. Blood test, MRI, uh, X-ray, what? We don't know. Two out of every three patients are discharged from the hospital without even knowing their diagnosis. I can tell you more than this. Uh, when I got in the emergency room, something like 10 years ago, the physician even didn't tell me that they need to go to this child, just tell me to go. And only a week after when I <laughs> uh, gave uh, my physician the, uh, the, the summary of the emergency room, he told me, but you didn't discharge, you need to return to the hospital, to the, uh, to the emergency room, to this, to, to this child. So, it's uh, even more uh, problematic. On average, physician wait just 18 seconds before interrupting patients' narratives of their symptoms. It's like a house, the dirt, it's from soil. soil. He, do, he doesn't listen, he just see the test and that's it. And communication failure, rather than a provider of lack of physical skill, what are the rules? The root of air over 70% of serious adverse health outcomes in hospitals. Then we have a great tradition. We have a great system to educate the physician. However, we don't have a, so much great system to educate them how to speak with the patient. So how do cultural diversity uh, related to Israel? And where does we where we see it. I can take myself, for example, my uh, father uh, born in Casablanca in Morocco, my mother was born in Romania in Yashi, and we can see only this one example for the culture that's coming. We can see from Russia, from Yemen, from Egypt, from the United States, from the UK, from France, uh, where I live, we can see all of this culture. Or we can see Ethiopian, let's just speak with them. It's Another, uh, you need to know how to speak with Ethiopia. Because they speak other, they, they won't tell you what you want for you. They will tell you what they think that you want for you, and not what you want for you. You see it in the third thing, the communication. To not to ask the patient a uh, direct question. To know, uh, to know if the patient wants you, to tell him, uh, all the, uh, the diagnosis, or not. Uh, to know if he will speak with you or not. If you will uh, bring a, a Jewish Orthodox, maybe she will bring with her husband, or Muslim, maybe she will uh, come with her husband. If she comes with her husband, then maybe she won't tell you all of the things. Maybe you need to send her to a female physician. I think that you need to know, at least to be in your head, uh, speak with them, to communicate uh, with the patient. In the dying patient, we can see one of the act here in Israel, where the dying patient law. It's exactly the dilemma between Orthodox <coughs> Jewish to secular Jewish. Uh, the dying patient law said that all the, that the base of the law is the value of life to the Jewish religion. That means no one can die. You prolong the life no matter what. But if you have a secular Jew, if he doesn't want to prolong the life, if he want to stop the medical treatment, the law doesn't let him. Medical authority for the patient. Is the patient coming for you or for a rabbi? for any other uh, 
religious figure, we have two rabbis here in Israel. Let's give a medical uh, consultation. Even for physicians, they give medical consultation. But you need to know. You need to know that maybe if you want to give him treatment, we will go to a rabbi to confirm it. Or not. And organ donation. Here we have the organ donation card. Uh, an interesting thing, and it's uh, related to the subject before, is you have a, an option to sign that's uh, only a religious figure according to your family uh, will can decide if you will uh, donate your organs or not. It's not only a specific the patient part, and also a religious uh, person, a religious figure need to decide. There are also a uh, there also a problem if uh, religious uh, people will sign it or not. Uh, something like six, seven years ago, there was an article in the newspaper about the Orthodox family that uh, they got for the kids the organs for, an, for a Muslim uh, child. But when he asked them, will you uh, donate the organs? They said, no, it's okay to get isn't okay to give. Especially, and this was the part that uh, disturbed me the most, that they didn't want it to go to uh, people from other religions. I think it was only this case, I, it was the only time to heard it, but still, it's a different in culture, different in mentality. So what is culture? Culture is a change that make us what to tell us to okay. interpret a life in the communication between each other, relationship, according to our community, religious, uh, it can be even uh, town, friends, family, everything that affects us, and our see life, and our see yeah. ethical dilemmas. The ethical dilemma that we see, the, the ethical dilemma when you have a problem with the conflict of the patient and, and physician. You have, if you take the dying patient, you have the will of the patient uh, versus the, the law. The, the physician that he must obey the law. Also, if you have uh, the patient that doesn't want to, want to hear uh, the diagnosis, still the will of the patient against the medical responsibility of the physician. What will be more important? This one or this one? The problem is ethical dilemma that don't have most of the time a clear solution. Most likely that neither one of the solution, all of the sites will be added. And communication. This is what we speak about. How we can convey how we will talk to the, to the patient and how can we understand what he wants from us? Or how can we understand if he understood us correctly? So what we can, we can do to improve the physician, uh, physician patient encounter? We need to pay attention, or at least for what I think, for the next thing. The problem that may arise in culture, in a cross-cultural medical encounter. Again, it can be a, a female and a male, depends on the religion. It can be the Ethiopian, by the way. This is the, uh, the patient's tired. Uh, uh, don't look at you. They didn't look, they were so quiet, so gentle, just to get the word out of them, where to bring an interpreter, and the Ethiopian interpreter that's working in the hospital. They didn't speak with us. To learn more about the patient, you can ask him, speak with him, ask him about his family, about his community, where he lives, what he likes, maybe to joke with him. To think him about his individual, not as a part of all the community. We can also see different people inside the community not as part of the state or a big group, 
Everyone is different. Join the clinical counter, not to look so much on the computer. We have a problem. When the patient arrives to the room, we look right into the computer. I know that at least when I went to pay to a physician, I don't think that if I would go, uh, went outside the, the physician room, we would remember how it looked like. Most likely, we remember only what he wrote. I can understand why he do it, but, but it's still not the only thing in the encounter that you need to do. Listen to the patient with sympathy and to understand how he look about the problem. We can see it, there was a case uh, about uh, a lady, a 26 year old Italian lady, if I remember correctly, that uh, she was ill. She thought that her illness was because of a witchcraft. But the physician didn't listen to her, didn't perceive a problem as he should have done, and he couldn't treat her. It also can be when the uh, patient going out of the room before to hear him, to hear if he understood what the physician told him, if he know how to take the medication, maybe if he thinks differently about his illness as the physician thing, then the, uh, what the physician did, he won't take the medication as he should. And to involve the patient in our talk, you know, what we want to do with him, and to tell him, we want to send you to MRI, X-ray, another physician, to blood test that you will know it. Not you will come to the clerk after him and say, the physician gave me this, what should I do? Question that I believe that may help the physician to learn about the patient. First thing is to explore the meaning of the illness for the patient. If you look again for the, the patient that's told that their illness will be cut off witch cut, what do you think? Maybe it's bad spirits. I know that the, nowadays we're less and less it, but still we have, even in Israel, we have a Jehovah Witness, so we need to know it. Uh, some, sometimes, all, uh, again, I return to Ethiopian, also think about it. Because we can still need to know it. We, uh, we can ask him, what do, what do you think of the problem? What do you call it? We can also ask him, how does it affect your life? Maybe you'll we'll find out that the illness was an happy occasion for the patient. Maybe it helped him to look on the bright side of life. Maybe you want some, only someone to speak with him. And how severe What worries you the most about this disease? The patient's agenda. How can I most uh, be helpful for you, to you? You want me to treat you? You want me uh, just to listen to you? You want me to send you to another physician? What do you want from me? And what is the most important for you? Your family, the quality of life, being alive no matter what, again, to tell me to the dying patient. What is the patient will, not what is the physician will, not what I want, what he want. And we have a doing illness. Have you seen anyone else about this problem besides the physician? Maybe you want to see a rabbi? Maybe you went to see another uh, figure. Maybe he called uh, his father, mother. They told me how to treat it. If you use non-medical remedies or treatment for your problem, it maybe will help us understand if you use herbal treatments. If you use all kinds of alternative treatments, maybe he doesn't believe in conventional treatment, but at least it will help us, it give us the option to understand what you want. And who advises you about your health? Again, return for the medical authority for the patient. Who is it, the rabbi? Husband? Uh, 
father, mother, depending the, also can depend on the hierarchy of the family. And how can we encourage the question of if we know how to communicate with the patient, it's not only to know to know him better, it's also how we can improve his confidence, his compliance for the treatment, to know that he will want to return us more. Again, how can we encourage him to heal? First of all, we explore the meaning of the illness according to the patient. That can be. Tell me about the good thing that's happened to you in the last two or three months. Help him see it in a different way. Not only the bad thing, but if, what good came for me. What do you think caused those things to happen? It can also be, how can I assist you? Again, I'm here for you. How can I help you? It's uh, important to see that it's part of uh, this, the way this those question is written. It's to give the patient hope, to let him see the good thing that came from the illness. Explore the patient's value. Uh, what is the most important thing to you right now? Again, maybe just to be alive. Yeah. To a prolonged life, no matter what. His kids maybe want to spend more day with his grandchildren. Maybe this is the most, the things most important to him. What gives you the most hope? And I think this is exactly where we as a medical uh, team come to give the patient hope. And uh, again, I think the thing that uh, all, all of us uh, like oh, oh, for a better life, or oh, for a better future, to so give the patient home. The importance of the family to the patient. Uh, is there someone else who would like to take part of the discussion regarding treatment? To dump someone else that you want to be here? You want to return with, with someone else that will help you? And the, and the question, he said that he isn't alone, not only we are looking for him, also his family is important. The question uh, gives us and they give, give him the option to think about someone else that can help him. And he, only I will say is to give him the feeling that he isn't alone. And how can your family help you deal with your situation? He has uh, all his close family that can help him, that can be with him, that can comfort him, that can listen to him. So who is and how can they help him? For conclusion, as you heard in my presentation, I think that's one of the things that's most important between the physician and patient, physician-patient relationship is how we speak with one another. It's the basic thing for a good uh, treatment. This is what, what I consider a good treatment. I can say it again, I'm not a physician, but they do work in ambulances and in a clinic, in a study, or as a phlebotomist. And it's the basic thing. The people return not only for the best one, they return for the one that's listened to them. They return for the one that they know that is there for them. And the so inside of the computers, inside of the technology, afraid from lawsuit, that we think about ourselves, what we want, not what the patient want. Maybe, only maybe, hope that it will be. If we will think about the patient, we will involve him in what we think that should be done. Maybe we'll see it better a medical system will be to see a more and more patient that get better and not a patient that's uh, prefer to be at home and not getting treatment because they, they don't want to see the physician. And although we, they teach it in medical school, apparently understanding that 
we are in all the patients not to do the thing that is most easy for us. We are here to do something to help for the patient, and this is the job. The people that uh, came to this field, this is the job. How can we help the patient? Thank you. Give them 
and I say, this is who you are talking to. This is where I fit in this, what's going to happen. You know, I may or may not see you, but you are welcome to contact me. So that's the first premise. The computer is great. We have a fabulous electronic medical record system, and I share that with the patient because this is not my private stuff. This is theirs. And so sharing, you know, it's not... I don't have an attitude to the patient except that I want them to come out with... And I know out of this that only a third will turn out when I ask them next time to understand what I said. So I don't imagine as skillful as a communicator and as careful as I am that they are in any position. So that it's not sympathy, it's empathy. I understand where they're coming from. I have been on that side. Um, I can give you a, a, a terrible example. My father had a coronary artery report. So sure, the four there are already questions. Yes. But I have been on the other side of this equation. Yeah, I just want to end to tell you about the target. You mentioned that in Israel, this in two universities, that they instead of not only and more only than teach on teach them, they try try to do a personality test before uh, getting into medical school. Hopefully, that they will. Choose the better uh, people with uh, better personality. It actually hasn't made a difference in Australia, and they've done this. Again, I don't know what happened here. The result in Tel Aviv, they do a, a, a kind of test in the Be'er Sheva. They have to uh, interview to people to get in, exactly to try to... My friends who are doctors tell me in Canada, the government does not allow them time to talk to the patients. It's true. Well, everywhere. Yeah, well, here is also true, however. Everywhere. Here, here is also true, however. When a, a patient comes for the first time for the clinic in one of the HMO, they give him a double appointment. Instead of 10 minutes, they have 20 minutes. It's not, uh, as you say, oh, yo, yo, it's not so much, but it's still better than only 10 minutes. It's better than nothing. And we still need to walk with the thing. Hey, one more, yes. uh, A quick question, and I could give a dissertation too if there's time. The question is this. Uh, you are speaking of multicultural phenomena. Yeah. yeah? Uh, I suggest first that uh, ethics and trust uh, and patience Affirmatively, are the most cost effective, and that leads to the question uh, the culture that is dominant is bio medical, bioscience, biotechnology, and the uh, elements that you speak to relating to the patient to doctor relationship have a foundation in physical matter, but also uh, have an intangible, not material basis in our connections. And if one takes only a material, biomedical, biotechnological stance, we're not on the same planet. In a way, it's worse than a two-state, one-state. It's true, just we're not even talking about the same thing. Uh, what is your sense about that? Well, that's the question. Yeah, but again, you can give just the term on the, on the uh, repeat on the question. But the question is a matter of the culture in medicine, the culture of material technology, uh, and the, the culture that says, that is a foundation, but it is not enough. There has to be the, the, the human engagement. The, the, the different cultures, in my experience, what is your, your sense about that? I think that we can see this uh, for what I see most of the physicians that I work with them yeah. uh, think only about uh, working in front of the computer. They prefer that the patient will be away if they could uh, sit on Skype. It will be better. 
uh, when the served in the army, he was in charge of a, uh, of a military clinic, and the thing that was the, uh, it was interesting the most, for what I think, for one, about one of the two of the physicians that spoke with me, that's about the communication, they said that they, they, they were awful, they went to see a family, they, they went to be a family practitioner. So they prefer the, only the computer not to see the patient. However, I think that they also see that there isn't an option, at least for now, to be only in front of the computer. And maybe they thought that the family practitioner is less about speaking and more about the computer, but you still can uh, disconnect both of, uh, both of the things. Although you try, and the physician that I know that's tried went to clinical studies to be in charge of a study and not uh, and didn't continue working uh, in medicine. Uh, but again, uh, they see more and more cities, they can't disconnect both of the things, and more and more, I think, and I see returns for the physician that were uh, 40, 15, 60 years ago, and I speak uh, from a physician that I know that studied. Uh, medicine in London 40 uh, years ago, and she speak with the patient. And as it also been mentioned, she give them a phone number. And more and more we tend to understand it, it can't be done. Uh, to get it out to a kind of world, uh, one want to go there, one want to go there. I think that they say that it has to be combined. And this is exactly how we can combine them and not losing the communication skill and we can't lose the computer because if you lose it, a lot of, especially in the US, a lot uh, will come to sue you if you don't have it uh, written. Please? Yes. To speak to that point, um, until May, Tammy, from the psychiatrist in New York, um, to speak to that point about being sued, there is evidence, and it must be not what your, your study was trying to find, but the greater con right, so better communication leads to fewer suing, suings, uh, less, less lawsuits towards doctors. Um, so it's generally, uh, the lawsuits, at least in Brooklyn and Bronx in New York, where you work, it's spreading to Canada. Yeah, but it's spreading to everywhere. Yeah, and, it, and you know, who knows if it's related to greater computer use and less personal communication. Um, but that's one thing, so I don't know. There is a benefit to trying to improve your communication. Just to, to agree with your point and to address sort of your point, which sounds like you're wondering if it's not a, it's not multicultural, but rather the culture of medicine versus the, the culture of the doctor versus the culture of the patient is the ultimate culture difference here. And as a psychiatry consultation service um, provider, most of the consultations in the hospital would come down to, uh, when we're asking about patient's capacity to make decisions, you get called because the patient's refusing. It's ultimately 85% of the time is because they were not explained the procedure in a language that they would understand or in a way that they understand, so they were not spoken to. It's a big research. Jeff Kaufman, he wrote a book, uh, Doctor, How to Think. And he wrote that a nice doctor had not so much complaints from the patients. So a nice doctor, you know, doctor can really communicate with the patient. So it's a good point. Just a minute, you okay. know. Yes. Okay, and what you're describing is really the way that palliative care physicians are trained to speak to their patients. And everyone thinks that palliative care is only for terminal ill patients. I'm not a surgeon, but I've learned a lot about how to communicate with my patients for my, my palliative care colleagues. Uh, I also, I can't help doing a little self-promotion, I'm going to be presenting a little later on a patient, partially on a patient-centered care philosophy uh, called blink and the hospitals that participate in the play tree program, you know, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but I think we all know that randomized controlled trials are not necessarily the deal of the role, have significantly better patient satisfaction scores and significantly fewer lawsuits than 
hospitals outside of the network. It's a relatively small network now, but it, it really is one way to, to, to get to this. Yeah. Uh, I'm Bert Luca, Professor of Comparative Ethics and Art Ethics at Leuven University in Belgium. Um, well, I just wanted to add something very briefly. I agree completely with what, what you said about the centrality of the specific, concrete person or patient that is in front of them. And that should be the start of, of, of all communication. But however, I think it's very important too that uh, you know as much as possible about the general culture or worldview of, or religion of people. And, and this worldview or religion or culture, of course, as a, an individual face in the patient sitting in front of you, but it is also very important to know something about this broader culture, this broader understanding of illness and of the varieties uh, in, in these cultures uh, that, that, that you find. So I think in, in trying to improve communication, it is one essential thing to, to let's say, uh, address the individual, to learn people to address the individual patient, but at the same time, is it important in a multicultural context that people get to know at least something about the understanding, basic understanding of illnesses, of health, and so in different cultures and varieties in these cultures. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to produce a vignette for you. She's an Ethiopian woman. She doesn't speak English. She has been a refugee. She comes with an interpreter who speaks good English and her dialect. She has cervix cancer, which can be cured, but not by surgery, with radiation, some chemotherapy, and therapy, and she has a 95% chance of a full, full cure. She is beyond childbearing, so that is and this is explained to her, and she appears to understand that she says, no, I will not have this treatment. So she's interviewed a second time. The third time, I called her imam, and I said, it's a possibility she has a religious objection to allowing men, because there were only males, to treat her. Can you speak with her? It's my understanding in Islam, like in Judaism, that saving life it's very important. He agreed with me and he spoke to her. Her reason for objecting was that one of her relatives had been taken from Addis Ababa to France for chemotherapy for leukemia and had come back with dreadful side effects, had lost her hair, and she died. And she was not going to subject herself to Western medicine. So you can see some of the cultural difference. We can take all the steps, but they may not divulge to you what worries them most about what you represent. And you cannot know this without spending a lot of individualized time. It is up to the physician, it's true, and this probably is what this plain treatment program does. It, it looks at the patient's centered view of the situation. It's very sad for this woman because she was curable, unlike her cousin, who was probably incurable. And chemotherapy for cervix cancer is a completely different business chemotherapy for leukemia, but she was not prepared to listen any further. Not based on her culture, based on her personal experience. So one, one, one has to be very careful when looking at people with this way. The women who come in who say, I don't want to be treated by a man, a third of them have been sexually violated by men in their family. And I know that for a fact. That's a worldwide statistic. And so it's, it, one has to be careful with these things. One has to assume it may have happened, not, not wait. But this is experience. You cannot get this from a simple workshop or from a series of things or even from the system. You know, you learn it from experience. Right. You know, the psychiatrist is lucky she gets 40 minutes to talk to a patient. One, I will have one sentence and then and you will get the last one. But this is just, uh, I think this is the place of the question to ask you about air value, what's important to air. Because when you ask about it, you it just makes the point. It just makes the yeah. point that it may be a much more protracted discussion than 40 minutes or 60 minutes or that. Thank you. One of the things I think in terms of the medical culture is that the model we use as the diagnostic model, which looks at what's wrong with the patient, 
come back to address. And I think we fail to look at the issue, but I think we have to be more forthright and to ask more directly what's right with the patient as well. What are their resources? How have they addressed it in the past? What has worked? What has failed? And I think that that comes to what you're doing. But you can do that in very short script. One can do it in three or four or five questions upon initial interview, and you have a better picture of the strength of that patient. You also have an idea of how to approach what you want to do with the patient, the guidance that you want to give the patient. So I would suggest we need to add to our black boxes or our what we carry around, the idea of looking at where are the strengths of this patient and utilize those in the, in the diagnostics and the treatment of that patient. I think that's also about your point that uh, not only in medicine, but in you know, all life, we can see that it's easier to us to think about what we want, what we want, what we want. You see a lot of people, they, they growing up, they say, here with coaching. They don't know how it's exactly in English, but it's exactly that point to see what's good with your life. People just add enough to see what bad in their life. They want to see what's good in their life. So they are looking for other people in other places. You go to other people that can help them to see what's good in their life. And this is like exactly the question, what is good in your life? Our life is not so bad. They're even pretty good, most of the time at least. Strong, strong, strong points. Thank you. Thank you.